safety and human health and planetary health together in more systemic ways and the other around uh, showing a path to the future through dialogue in uh, individuals, uh, individual and institutional change and trade unions. We are live. Yeah, we can begin. Yeah. Okay. Let me do check. Well, hello, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we are uh, very happy to to have this uh, fantastic panel that today we will talk uh, about uh, protecting, preparing and transforming cities, regions and nations. Uh, this is one uh, a spin-off, is one is a breakout session that is part of the initiative of the ESIR group. The ESIR group, for the ones that uh, they have not been this morning, is a kind of think tank, is an expert group that we try to support, to advise the European Union, the Commission, on the transformation that we will need to confront not only the COVID crisis that probably will have a deadline, also to prepare Europe to transform Europe and to support European citizens to confront future crises and to confront one of the big challenges that is the uh, to confront the climate change. And of course, today we will speak about the Green Deal. Also, we 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 need to know that uh, we have we are facing deep, deep challenges in this moment, and one of the big challenges is how to uh, as as. Uh, my colleague says this morning, how to act by design and not by disaster, means the key word is anticipation and how to anticipate to support the society to be more ecologic and to not let no one behind, to not need to choose between business, society, the social aspect of the transformation and also the necessity to rebuild all that you understand, we understand that is uh, the, the new scenario that we need to confront. We have as a ESIR group, we have prepared, uh, we have launched a policy brief that was titled Protect, Prepare and Transform Europe, Recovery and Resilience Post-COVID-19. And the idea uh, of this uh, paper was to begin to provide views and solutions to the society and to the uh, researchers, to the academics, because we have seen that in the past, the research and innovation was not always focused on people, was focused on to achieve a project, to have a, a new position paper. And now uh, the, the idea and the objective and the aim is to have the the key at the focus in the people. We need to prepare people, we need to prepare uh, our uh, society and our citizens for to confront not only the COVID, but also the climate change challenge. And why cities and regions? Because cities and regions are the most close uh, say administrations and the, the more close to the to the citizens and to the society is where we live is the regions that we have uh, good or bad landscapes and it's very important that we know that all action have an impact all actions that we will do in the coming months will have an impact and in this uh, special uh, session we want to take into account the social impacts that this transformation will have the impacts on jobs, the impacts on the landscape, and we need to put the focus on how we can unpack the tensions, as we used to say, to not to not uh, have a priority on business, on social. We must put the focus on the people. People is more important than ever, and people need transparency, and people need uh, to know that they are part of this transformation. That's why today we have invited key speakers that uh, they come from different uh, regions and cities in Europe, but also we have uh, uh, speakers that they have uh, been in negotiations, in good projects that will show us 
that with engaging all the actors is possible to have a better planet and uh, a better uh, society. I want to uh, begin to present uh, the fantastic speakers that we have today. First, I want to present Kirsten Dunlop, that is the, the, the colleague from the ESIR group that will join me, will accompany me as a, as a co-moderator. And we have also Santiago, uh, Kirsten Dunlop is the, the chair of the Climate Kick and she's from Australia and she is the general manager of strategic innovation. Uh, at this moment, also, she is here as a representative of the ESIR group. We will have also Santiago Segura Martinez de Toda, that she's an engineer, professor, and politician, and she will be here presenting the case of the Madrid city because she is the, the, the person that serves in the Madrid City Council since 2019. We will have also Frederick Mock, that is the head of the department uh, of the DGB, the German Trade Union Confederation federation and is the responsible for policy industry and services we will have enrique lopez from the industry federation in commissiones obreras in spain and we will have also tom thomas bosch that uh, has been employed as minister of education and uh, now uh, she is employed at the slovenian research agency currently she is director general he is director general at science directorate of minister of education in slovenia we will have also Pior Maslowski, the deputy mayor of the city of Ribnik. He is the former president of the Association for the Center for Development of Social Initiatives. And uh, now uh, he is uh, the co-founder of the Ribnik Citizens Forum. We will have also with us Xavier Barandian, that is the strategic advisor of the Gipuzkoa Regional Council in, uh, in País Vasco, in Spain and currently lectures at the Faculty of Social and Human Science of the University of Deusto. Welcome to all uh, this fantastic panel and I will pass the, the floor to my colleague Kirsten that will launch the first round of questions to this uh, panel that will support us to better unpack this tension and we will have good models to uh, implement and to follow for to have a good and uh, recovered uh, Europe after this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Thank Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Monserrat. Let me just check that you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I will uh, I just make one apology on my behalf um, for Xavier Barandian. Is, uh, in fact, uh, Gipuzkoa will be represented by Sebastian Zurtutha, uh, who is the strategy special advisor representing Xavier. And uh, Xavier is not here because, in fact, COVID has called for his attention uh, oh. in the region. So we have a very topical reason for this late minute change. So I would uh, really just uh, thank very much in anticipation our panelists. Um, this is very much a session about the demonstration of possibility of showing the way of pathfinding uh, where we know that one of the most challenging uh, situations we face is to connect words such as systemic modernization and transformation for a sustainable and resilient future to action in real places and contexts where ordinary people can understand and make sense of that in the terms that they feel is meaningful and, and practical. And here we'll have six examples of different instances in which the failure of imagination is being met by leadership, by action, by experimentation, and by hard lessons. Not all of them positive, but all of them are lessons uh, to, to keep facing into the challenge and bringing optimism and hope to Europe. So I'm going to start uh, by thanking Santiago Saura, uh, the Councillor for International Affairs and Cooperation in the City of Madrid. Um, Santiago, what can you tell us about Madrid? The City of Madrid is running a deep demonstration project. How is it relevant to recovery and to building back better in the wake of, of a particularly hard treatment by COVID-19? And how are you finding it possible to progress the commitments to sustainability and mobility um, and urban infrastructure in the changes you have in, in Madrid? 
Thank you, thank you very much, Kirsten and Montserrat, for, for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be here in this session with you today. In Madrid, we are in fact uh, honored to be one of the few 15 European cities that are working as a demonstration city of Climate Kick, specifically in the deep demonstration of clean and healthy cities funded by Climate Kick. In this uh, Madrid, Madrid deep uh, demonstration, we bring together multiple partners from the city, of course, the Madrid City Council, but also the Academia, Technical University of Madrid, private companies like Ferrovial and other companies and social actors. And uh, from the Madrid City Council, we uh, work with a group, uh, the climate group, that includes uh, senior officials from multiple departments from the Madrid City Council, not only those uh, directly related to the implementation of actions towards the carbonization, such as environment or housing departments, but also departments that are related to the city economy and to the municipal budget. So in, in this deep demo, the Madrid City Council is the challenge owner, so the one that best uh, knows which are the, the, the challenges, the context, the needs and, and the constraints. And because, it's, as, as Montserrat said, it's an administration that is, is closest to the citizens, but in the deep demo, these challenges are shared and discussed in a multi-actor engagement process to, let's say, co-create and co-design innovation that can accelerate climate action as in the city. We have been working in this way uh, for more than one year already. But as you know, more recently, the COVID uh, came and impacted strongly our cities and our lives. Uh, However, uh, we have seen that, in fact, the, the lines of work and experimentation that we were developing in the context of the demo are actually as important or even more necessary now in the COVID or post-COVID scenario than they were before, either uh, as they were already being developed or with some, some adaptations. So we, which are the, the specific lines of work or examples of uh, strategic experiments that we are uh, working with in the Madrid demo? There are several of them. Uh, for example, on sustainable mobility, for instance, here uh, we have developed uh, an initiative to flatten the rush hour in the city transport system to contribute to a sustainable but also a equitable mobility, avoiding, of course, traffic congestion, but also crowding of the public uh, transport system and minimizing in this way also the risk of COVID infection. This initiative consists in the engagement and collaboration of different public administrations, private companies, universities, trade unions, to implement and coordinate telework, flexible work arrangements, and other mobility options. There are other lines of work, for example, on nature-based solutions and urban greening, for example, and importantly, the municipal plan to develop the metropolitan forest, which is a 70 kilometer long ecological and social corridor that will surround the entire city of Madrid. It is now um, even more necessary to increase, increase the availability of uh, high quality open space for the citizens in proximity to the houses, providing green areas, cycling paths and other opportunities for outdoor sport and leisure. And we do this in a equitable manner as it is covered and distributed all throughout the surroundings of the city of Madrid. And also our collaboration with the deep demonstration includes uh, the development of a business case of the decarbonization of the city of Madrid, supported in fact by Material Economics, which is one of the partners of, of Climate Kick, that Kristen knows well. That we are in this context analyzing different decarbonization levers in the city and analyzing the costs that, and the benefits of each of these levers, which includes the direct economic benefits for the city, for example, associated to energy savings, but also other benefits such as job creation or health benefits in general. I interestingly, the analysis uh, is showing that most of these decarbonization levers have a positive or perhaps a net economic outcome for the city. And uh, we see that therefore, um, environment, uh, quality of life, um, health, job creation, prosperity, all these uh, important uh, properties in the city are linked together in this path towards climate neutrality. So this is a reality and a narrative that uh, I want to stress that I think is key to engage more and more citizens in support and increase in ambition towards decarbonization. Um, in summary, uh, to Thank conclude, the, the work in, in the Madrid demo I think is contributing to an innovative uh, approach to improve and move forward projects 
that are crucial for the city, both for the post-COVID recovery and for the required uh, acceleration to decarbonization and make this happen at a scale that certainly the city council cannot, cannot achieve alone. Thank you very much indeed. And we will come back then in, uh, in the end of this session, towards the end of this session to, to compare some notes here. So let us move um, to another city uh, working in a similarly uh, set of, of really difficult and different challenges. Uh, Piotr Maflowski, uh, the city of Rybnik in uh, Silesia in Poland. You are bringing together a focus on just transformation and on an innovation-led transformation in that context in a context of profound challenges in industrial and social change and, and politics as well as policy. Uh, what benefits does this combination uh, offer and what is needed to support the kind of approach you are trying to take to achieve the ambitions of the citizens of Rybnik? Uh, I will start with, with uh, I want to start with describing the situation. Uh, because uh, we have a uh, uh, really uh, high social tension related to the energy transformation just now in our region. It's a region uh, where we have uh, 400,000 of miners. Uh, and until the presidential election, the government assured miners that it would not uh, close mines. After the election, they, are, they presented a project of the changes and uh, they want to close down a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, coal mines. The framework program itself makes sense, but there is not enough information, information on protection programs for miners and uh, no economic pro program for towns and cities uh, like Rybnik. So, of course, the miners felt very cheated with, with the situation. Uh, by the 2030, the share of coal in the Polish energy sector is, is to drop to the less than 50%. By 2040, only three mines are to operate. Uh, currently, the share of coal is about 80%, of which hard coal is 55 and lignite is 25. Uh, we can ex expect that the next year to coal mines, Rudo and Vuje, and Vuje will be closed, and there is 7.7 thousand people uh, of, uh, of employers. Uh, so uh, the effect is that uh, at the moment we have a strike, and there is more than 230 people protested underground in 10 mines. Uh, in 10 mines, uh, the strike begins uh, two days ago, so it's growing in the moment. And uh, we are really afraid of the situation because uh, trade unions announced that the only solution is to escalate the strike and use methods known from the past, such as occupying public building and street protests in Warsaw, during which tires were burned and the police were attacked with screws and other metal parts used in mines. It's maybe not an answer for your question, but it shows, it's a, shows our problem. Uh, I hope that, uh, that the answer is in the situation of, of Rednik, and I hope that there is an innovation and there is a good path. Uh, because we have uh, 136,000 of inhabitants, two operating coal mines in the city, coal fired or uh, coal-fired power plant. Maybe uh, now our economy is uh, diversified, but uh, coal is crucial. And uh, one of the biggest problem is that every winter um, we are among the 10 cities with the most polluted air in Europe. Uh, the reason is that we use a coal to heat buildings, single family houses, but also offices and small, uh, small industries. Uh, our, the city of Rybnik is thermomodernizing municipal buildings, school sport facilities, special municipal apartments. We want to eliminate coal fire stoves during the next five years. The cost of this operation is about 40 million of, of euro. And the city has launched also an uh, advisory point for residents interested in obtaining money from external sources, financing the change of 
of heating. We are all looking for investors and we are holding uh, talks with entities interested in the development of the green economy. And we are supported, of course, by, by uh, Climate Kick in the process of deep listening. So uh, we have 1,500 arguments mapped. We have more than uh, 900 of surveys, 200 of interviews, nine workshops, four draft reports from deep listening. So we are at the moment, uh, at the moment we are thinking about uh, solutions. We know, now we have a knowledge about the problem. Now we are in the process of discussing with, with the people and we try to engage them into the process. And the next thing is to, uh, to operate, to do something with them. Uh, and there was prepared something what is called the magic triangle. Uh, because it includes three elements. The first one is uh, futurist literacy, because there is a tendency to think right now we just cannot afford to deal with the environmental issues. It would make our difficult situation even worse. So the natural approach is then to omit or ignore climate issues. The second uh, point of the triangle is the future of work because working in mining industry still is being uh, pers uh, is a relatively stable one. It's a good good job in, in our city. And the last, uh, last thing is policy innovation based on constant learning, refining and courage to do things differently that it was always done. And uh, I have one maybe interesting fact that uh, today one of the researchers involved in the project was talking with the miners 800 meters underground. So his photos, uh, the guy is dirty with the coal dust, make a sensation on social media in our uh, in in Poland. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the topic of coal is uh, is um, a thread in, in this session. I'm going to pass to Enrique Lopez, who is uh, working very much on this problem of how to engage those who are working right in the heart of coal extraction and processing in a different uh, set of agreements uh, in the coal regions of Castilla y León specifically. How have you tried and how have you been resolving social and environmental tensions between communities, between workers, uh, with environmental priorities and the need for industrial transformation? And what role is the impact of COVID-19 playing in this process? Okay, thank you very much, Montserrat and Kristen, for having me here. Uh, well, Comisiones Obreras defends that the energy transition in our country, in Spain, must be fair and uh, without leaving anyone behind. Then in, in 2018, we launched a proposal for a just transition agreement to the new uh, socialist government. And this proposal was accepted uh, by the government with uh, little amendments. And the consequence was in 2018, we saying the framework agreement for a just transition of coal mining and sustainable development of mining regions. In this agreement, this is a tripartite agreement and it engaged the government, the unions and the employers associations. The agreement contemplates the early retirement for suitable workers in the mines, uh, then incentivated layoffs for miners and a fund of 250 million to support business and development initiatives in the mining regions. In the agreement, finally, we agree for the creation of the Institute of Restructure of Coal Mining to manage assistance and promote business initiatives. As an example of these initiatives, there are two miners restoration projects to convert the, the mine to the tourist sector. These projects are currently paralyzed because of COVID. This year, 2020, in full lockdown by the COVID, we signed a, frame, a framework for a just transition agreement for the closure of coal power plants. Okay, 
And this agreement is based on the familiar core frame, framework agreement. And the main goals are maintaining employment in the territories, then the economic and industrial uh, re revitalization linked to the projects of deployment of renewable energies. And in addition, in addition the old IRC Institute is renamed as Institute of Just Transition. Each zone, with, with each zone, its region will develop its own just transition agreement based on the coal agreement. Now, uh, let's talk about the intervention in Castilla Leon. Currently, the government and Iberdrola are working in a just transition agreement for the closure of two coal fire plants, uh, Lada and Belilla. The commitments are for the owner company workers, uh, we uh, promote the early retirement. If uh, the workers couldn't retire, then relocate the rest of the workers in other facilities of the company. And then in case of this agreement, uh, we promote incentive-based layoffs. For the contractor companies, we use the same assumption as the for the property. Then a job bank is also generated for preferential relocation in new projects. There are more than uh, 150 projects in a, st in a study for the reactivation of the area. Uh, this same agreement also includes, includes uh, an, a specific uh, training for retraining workers given by Iberdrola and uh, BET local providers. Uh, and uh, we think it, it should be very good for the workers that want another work. And uh, we hope that this first agreement signed by Iberdrola will mark the way forward for the rest of the operating companies. Uh, and, and we think that with all these measures, we uh, we pretend that very few workers have left behind and bring a new economic alternative uh, for the areas affected uh, by the closure of, of the power plants. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so let, it, let us uh, take the inspirational example of this agreement with uh, Ibidrola and pass to, to, to Frederick. Um, again, um, very much in this challenging but important space of no just transition or no just transformation that does not have the participation directly of workers. Uh, so we know that in accordance with the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement, it is crucial to ensure that there is a just transition of the workforce and, where, and the creation of quality jobs. It's one of the key concerns of Madrid. It's absolutely the front and center concern of miners in Poland. Um, which mix of targets uh, of, of instruments that are targeting economic development and structural change and technology and social compatibility and climate action uh, all together in the cocktail have you been using in Lignite reasons in, uh, in Germany? And what role has social dialogue and unions and social partners played? Yeah, hello everybody. Thank you, uh, Montserrat and Kirsten, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to discuss this afternoon. Yeah, well, um, in Germany, you might know that we had some kind of commission uh, which made proposals for the coal phase out and the trade unions were part of this uh, commission. And um, I'd like to give you some ideas um, regarding this commission and our work as unions for the workers and for the regions. So first of all, let me say that we have in Germany 25,000 jobs in the coal sector, 80,000 jobs related to the coal sector and more um, and, and more jobs, 100,000 of jobs in the energy intensive industry, which are affected by um, competitive energy prices from the coal sector. So it's, it's still big business in Germany and it's um, important for our industrial value chain. So 
Um, when this commission started um, in 2018, um, we had lots of demands as unions. And now, two years later, all the legislative acts passed by the parliament. So um, we are more or less satisfied um, that the recommendations of the core commissions came into reality. But now the work starts, the work in the regions starts. And um, now it's time really for, for yeah, heavy action. So um, I wanted to talk about uh, four points which were um, very important from our point of view regarding this whole process of phasing out coal. So the first point is uh, to bring the energy transition in Germany to a success because it's necessary also for the workers uh, in the unions to understand that the coal phase out makes sense due to climate, but also due to the energy system, which needs to work after the coal phase out. The second point is um, it was necessary to give a clear sign to the workers, um, giving the security uh, to the current workers that nobody is left behind. So there is more or less a deep security grid for the workers in the coal mines and in the coal power plants. For example, um, there are tools like adjustment allowances that provides a bridge um, to, to early retirement. Um, we um, have the regulation that uh, collective bargaining agreements are um, a big part of the whole coal phase out process. So it's necessary that the companies have collective bargainings when they want to shut down coal power plants or mines. And um, yeah, it's also necessary that we have some kind of qualification programs and so on. This is also inside. The third point is um, giving a perspective, a reliable perspective for the regions. And um, it's necessary um, that we spend money for this, um, for sure. So we have a support scheme, structural aids for the regions, for the lignite regions, and also um, for the region with hard coal power plants. And um, yeah, there are some kind of mission statements um, from these regions for the developing um, in the next years. And this development um, has a link to the knowledge and the experience of the regions and of the workers. I think this is a big point um, when you want to develop or redevelop a region in a new way. The third point is um, that it is really necessary to involve the social partners in this whole process. So um, we made uh, sure, uh, we ensure that uh, the social partners are part of the decision-making authorities in the regions where to spend the structural aid for, for what kind of projects. So I think this is a big point too, because um, the social partners um, have a knowledge um, to, um, yeah, to develop together with the regions uh, a new concept of value creation in the region, a new concept of job creation in the region. And um, this was one big point for us. And um, yeah, maybe, maybe as a last remark, in this whole process um, for the unions, it was um, necessary to, to give an idea, to give a reliable idea that the new jobs um, will be decent jobs because the jobs in the coal sector are great. The working conditions are great. And um, we need to make sure that new jobs, for example, in the renewable sector have the same standards. Um, then we can motivate uh, workers to uh, go on this journey of transition and uh, go to new um, uh, job um, opportunities. And um, for us, for sure, it is necessary that we have this kind of co-determination here in Germany, which gives us as unions the power to say, yeah, we want to try to shape it together as social partners um, in such a uh, direction. So 
Um, Thank you. Yeah, as a summary, this just transition approach was a very good approach. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. So let us take then this question of, of co-determination and a sense of a vision for what alternative jobs could look like and take it to a national scale in Slovenia, where Slovenia is forging ahead on a vision for the future uh, that combines a number of industries. I'm going to pass now to Dr. Tomasz Bo, who is uh, in the Ministry of Education, Science and Sport. Slovenia is embarking on a, a visionary commitment, Tomasz, uh, to co achieving circular economy, circularity across five major industries by 2030. And I know you are taking an integrated approach to education, to innovation, to entrepreneurship, supported by policy and planning to achieve that. How do you see this initiative contributing to new skills and sustainable jobs uh, and jobs of high quality in Slovenia? What obstacles do you foresee as well as opportunities? Thank you um, very much, Kirsten. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the both moderators and also the respected colleagues um, uh, to be to have an opportunity to be part of this uh, discussion. And actually, maybe I will I would uh, add a bit different angle uh, to this uh, debate. Uh, in this first point, I would also like to thank the Climate Kick and Kirsten uh, with her um, team, actually, that uh, that they help us very much, actually, to start the process and hopefully also in the next years also have uh, results as we all uh, are um, thinking would be the most important uh, for Slovenia and also broader. Maybe I would not uh, like just to focus on new uh, skills and sustainable jobs, while I believe that both things, jobs as well um, skills, are the result of differences of uh, actually the different approach of the to the different to, to the politics to the policies and actually to uh, public affairs. Actually, first of all, I have to say that um, uh, our intention was, uh, in a way, uh, not to do the business as usual in the field of circular economy and actually green poli policies. Uh, we all know that actually uh, the green or circular is a quite uh, broad goal of different ministries, of different policies, and each of them usually looks only on its own silos. Actually, we have a quite um, fortunate situation that we start our ministry and some also some other um, public, uh, public bodies, a uh, very close collaboration with the Joint Research Center of the European uh, Commission and Climate Kick, and actually we decided that we should try a new way of making policy, of uh, actually regulating the public uh, uh, affairs and try to put together all our efforts to do something new. And actually the circular economy, I would say, is one of the very, very obvious uh, case studies. I have to say that we started even before the COVID-19 crisis. Why I said that? Because um, we have a very nice example at the moment how we should work together uh, different ministries, different perspectives um, in the case of COVID-19. It's quite natural that medicine, research, um, entrepreneurs and so on working together to have a common, to achieve a common goal. In our case, it was quite the same. We started with the circular as a common goal. And I would say this is, and uh, for sure, this is one of the most important things that we need uh, for transformation. We need a very strong and very, very tangible um, common goal. After that, I would say we need very, very strong political commitment and ownership of different parts of the government. While if there is only part of, of the institutions um, who would which would like to do something different, and if all the others are doing uh, business as usual, probably it the result will not be as it, it should be. The second, the, the third thing I would like to stress 
is a common, uh, in a way, structure. Let's say, uh, in our case, we started with a, a quite high-level um, working group composed of high officials uh, from uh, different ministries, actually, who are uh, sitting together and, uh, in a way, coordinating policies uh, and try to do coherent systems. And of course, uh, at the end, it's uh, also very important to include different publics. So when talking about the uh, broader approach, we should uh, take, in, uh, or take on board uh, also the uh, NGOs uh, and, other, and other players who are uh, at the end the beneficiaries of such an approach. And I would say in this respect that um, at the moment we have a quite a good, uh, a, a good uh, result of collaborating. Uh, we suddenly we um, realized there are so many things going on in the circular, in the field of education, in the field of um, uh, agriculture and forestry, in the field of um, spatial planning and environment and so on, that actually uh, we are starting or we are in, in a phase where it is possible to, uh, in a way, put together uh, our policies and that is even more important, put together our funds. Um, we are always, um, well, talking about lack of funds and it's actually always true, but when we put together resources, it's much, much uh, bigger uh, bigger amount of money uh, which is available and I believe also with a greater uh, possibility to have a very very good um, very good result and just for the end I would like to uh, go back to the skills and sustainable jobs if we'll do the business as we are doing probably we'll just prolong actually the stand the the, the traditional jobs and actually uh, also the skills needed for that. But we all know we are ahead of, uh, we are uh, actually in front of the uh, challenge, uh, challenges of um, um, greening uh, of, uh, so uh, uh, climate climate uh, challenges. Uh, we have the question of digitalization and for sure uh, the jobs of the future will be different as they are at the moment. And actually in our case study, we could say that with including the part of the uh, educational educational part of our ministry and the whole vertical to the universities and research and actually connecting them with uh, other ministries actually works quite 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 good and Thank maybe just very much, much. just just one thing which is the the the, the, the biggest threat uh, the political and policy commitments of all involved to do change. Yes, absolutely essential, as we know, and we are learning with you. Thank you very much indeed. So now let us uh, conclude the last of these glimpses into, into determined action and uh, challenge spaces uh, with the Regional Council of Kipuzkoa, uh, Sebastian. How I know you are engaged in a, a very ambitious program for social change and equality and participatory governance. How can local and regional communities and workers in your experience and vision be engaged more effectively in transformation so that we do reach a balance between people and planet and prosperity? What do you think recovery funding and the Green Deal action should prioritize to make that possible? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to uh, to participate in this debate. I'd like to apologize on behalf of Shabir Barandiran, who unfortunately can't be here this afternoon. First of all, I'd just like you to give you an idea of what the Gipuzkoa Provincial Council is and a little bit about the province of Gipuzkoa itself, because I'm sure that many of you don't know who we are. The Provincial Council is the entity which governs the province of Gipuzkoa in the Basque Country in Spain. And it has a political uh, responsibility uh, in public tax collecting. So we have the capacity to have our own tax system 
We also have power to promote the economy, the roads, social policies. We have a lot of devolved responsibility from the central government. We have our own uh, budget, and we also uh, we have uh, up to five. We, we collect up to five billion euros in uh, tax revenues every year. Gipuzkoa is a very industrial province. Uh, it's very competitive. And it has a fairly high degree of social cohesion. So I think those are the two aspects. Competitiveness and social cohesion are the two aspects I would really highlight about the province of Gipuzkoa. Uh, so we have uh, a fairly low, um, fairly low unemployment rate, although with the COVID-19 crisis, this has increased. At the beginning of this term of office last year, when we uh, established this strategic plan, we established a very clear vision, a vision which was inspired in all the different activities that we had been running in the, in the past. We basically said, Gepuzka aspires to be the community with the lowest levels of inequality in Europe. This is the overriding idea. This is overarching everything that we do. So just in this brief introductory explanation, I would like to talk to you about an initiative called Itorkisuneiraikis, which means in the Basque language, building the future. It's an initiative which was set up in 2016 by the Provincial Council. And uh, as the uh, colleague from Slovenia was talking about, the idea is to do something different, not business as usual, something else, a new way of relating to citizens. How? Well, to try to connect up and tap into their interests, the interests of citizens. Um, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have a new political agenda, and all of this is done through experimentation and collaboration. That's the idea that inspires everything that we do, and I'll just talk a little bit more about the initiative of Turkish Unirakis, building the future and what it actually means for the province. But first of all, what were the reasons why in 2016 we decided to set up this initiative? Well, there are two of them, mainly. First of all, there was political disaffection, a great degree of it. And secondly, we were uh, in a process of accelerated change, uh, which brings about a high level of uncertainty and a high level of complexity so this meant that we had to do something different. Uh, so we have to experiment and we have to cooperate in order to rise to these challenges. And this is what Iturkis Unerekis aims to do. What are the principles uh, on which we build? Uh, what are the foundations upon which we build the project? Well, there are two of them. The leadership of the Provincial Council of Gipuzkoa, that's on the one hand, but this has to be inserted in what we call the Gipuzkoa model, which is a model in which there's a high degree of participation by all sorts of different social stakeholders and economic stakeholders. We have a high degree of what we call social capital. And in the design of the initiative, Building the Future, uh, in that design, we wanted to take into account all of this participation. And this is a key element of everything that we do here, collaboration and cooperation. So what does it look like at the moment? the initiative was, well, as Kirsten said, it's an ambitious initiative. It includes a lot of different activities and projects, but I'll just outline some of the most important ones. Within the framework of smart specialization, here in the Basque country, we identified a number of different areas, specialist areas. And what we did in the previous term of office back in 2016 is that we identified our strengths. We looked at what we had, and we said, right, we're going to make a firm commitment to these sectors in which we are very strong and we are very good. And we've set up a series of what we call reference centers in which we're trying to develop strategies uh, hand in hand with the ecosystem which is established around these centers of reference. So here we're talking about, for example, healthy aging, electromobility, fight against climate change, and cybersecurity. There are another four centers, uh, but those four that I've just mentioned are the ones uh, that are linked most closely to the smart specialization process. And uh, this is impl implies a lot of a very heavy investment, investment in infrastructure, and then also the development of the strategies themselves. We also have spaces for reflection. So we have more deliberative groups, 
which again involve a wide range of different local stakeholders uh, to try to build a, a shared narrative. We have also a portfolio with 30 experimental projects in different areas. in the areas that we've identified as our strong points as well. And then we provide different financial aid to stakeholders who want to propose their own projects to us. So there is a wealth of different projects that we are helping to promote, mobilizing a large degree of resources to do this. And in all of them, there is participation, there is co-design in both the establishment of the, uh, the, the challenges and the solutions, and then the implementation of the solution in real situations. And then depending on the results of this experimentation process, they either get scaled up or not. Now, these are the key elements of what we're doing. And now I would just like to say, before I finish, that this strategy connects directly uh, up to the European Green Deal and its systemic approach. And we are very lucky because we've had the collaboration of the OECD and Climate Kick as well, which, is, which are helping us to really go through a very deep-rooted reflection in relation to this portfolio of projects that I mentioned earlier. They're also helping us to develop a much more holistic, systemic approach and outlook. So we feel very fortunate to have their help uh, we've organized a series of seminars and workshops between Climate Kick, the OECD, and uh, the, also a local uh, research center here in Mondragon and the Provincial Council, so that we've been doing a mapping of the projects, identifying the different connections between these different projects, and on the basis of that, trying to redefine a new portfolio and to connect up to other experiences for example, uh, the Vinova, which is the innovation agency in Sweden, for example. But the most important thing about this process is the capacity to learn that it is offering us and the, the, the opportunity to build networks thanks to the systemic approach. Now, the fourth idea that I wanted to talk about is that it's really important for us to connect the portfolio and the investments that are involved in it to the programs run by the Commission in order to increase their impact. And the way to do that, we believe, would be through strategies such as the deep demonstration or the super labs. But I would like to highlight the fact that our aim is not to, to get European funding. We want to establish uh, mechanisms for collaboration and learning. We do this because we believe that we coincide 100% with what the European Green Deal is trying to achieve. But as I said, getting European funding is not our main priority. But we also believe that we can contribute something. Gipuzkoa is putting at the disposal of the Commission its knowledge, its skills, to become a, a space for advanced ex experimentation for all other regions that would like to implement at a, a larger scale what we're doing here and with a systemic approach. Thank and finally, we're going to Sebastian. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm conscious it would be really lovely to have a little bit of time for, for then some final exchanges. So may, I would particularly like to pick up the idea that there is an opportunity also here for cross-pollination and exchange, which is one of the most important elements of this, this kind of context of the RNI days and the way in which the Green Deal and the missions coming after them actively call for and promote collaboration and ex, uh, partnerships across Europe in finding ways to, to frame and meet challenges and solutions and, and co-determine outcomes if we, if we take inspiration from the German uh, president. So can I um, ask, just put a question uh, to, I know there are, there are a couple of threads in this and uh, I will ask one and Monse uh, will ask another. Um, can I just ask any of you the sense of um, quality of life as a, le as a way of pulling in, of making it real and possible and imaginable for people to, mo to move forward into transformation. You heard about uh, the, uh, the very gritty challenges in Ribnik in negotiating uh, something that feels like a, a, the wrong end of the stick. 
um, the challenges of, of a large scale city like Madrid living through the impact of COVID and, and keeping its political purpose intact in regreening the city and, and experimenting with new regulation. Um, the opportunity in Slovenia of pooling funding, uh, but of looking for a vision around circularity that offers a quality of life. What um, do you believe it might be the unexpected partnerships and collaborations that communities form around and support policy and political action to accelerate transformation in partnership with governments at different scales? Um, are there any thoughts around that? And I will leave it to you, to anyone who feels like taking the floor, just signal to me and we will we'll just ask you for a very short comment. Santiago? Yeah, um, thank you, Kristen. Uh, very briefly, I would like to say that uh, I, I, take, I take your point uh, strongly. I mean, the message of quality of life is essential, probably uh, at all scales and levels, but particularly for big cities where the air quality with the public space, with the, yeah, of course, green, as you said, mobility, all these are so tightly linked to, 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 the, to, the, to the health, to the perspective of, of using uh, our city in, more, uh, in a more um, sustainable lifestyle. All this is crucial for the city. And we really need to pass this message to citizens. Transition to climate neutrality is not a burden. Transition to climate neutrality will give jobs that are uh, link it to the new uh, and emerging opportunities that will stand long for the future rather than linking this economy to sectors that are slowly decaying and are linked to, to, to all the economic models. And also we need to, to pass this message strongly. And not only to the citizens, but we also need, uh, let's say, as much as political support and political unanimity as possible. And in this way, uh, for example, in Madrid also, uh, because of the uh, difficult circumstances that we are experiencing and we experienced in the past with the COVID uh, impact, we uh, have uh, made an agreement of 350 measures that uh, want to uh, be uh, promoted for the recovery and the post-COVID, the aftermath situation. And, and these measures, I, I mentioned this because these measures include uh, an effectively a support to, to the climate kick uh, work and to the Madrid demo, which is uh, at this moment, very important for us for strategic thinking and for, for engaging city council with other actors, private companies, uh, social groups, other administrations, that universities that need to collaborate with us. Because very importantly, many of the investments that we need to do in this transition can be self-funded. So they don't, many of them are already, uh, can be already um, tackled by private companies just with a little impetus from the political side. But it's not that the Madrid City Council witness will necessarily need to put all this funding just to make the change happen. It's just to, through regulations, through political uh, uh, impulse, uh, to, to, to make this happen uh, or already in a self-funding uh, way for, for many of these decarbonization levers that I was mentioned before. Thank you, Santiago. Tomas, you had your hand? Yeah. Thank you very much. Very briefly, uh, actually, I would say that the quality of life uh, for all of the citizens and all the inhabitants um, is of crucial importance. So I would say that there is a very strong correlation uh, between the effort which is uh, needed for a transformation uh, and actually the willingness to start this transformation. If there is a comfort zone uh, for the people who are actually quite satisfied with their lives, um, probably there is a very, very um, minor uh, possibility for a big transformation. It's probably quite the same with the public sector. If there is not a very strong incentive that uh, we need to do that, uh, that because of the some major uh, higher goal, probably usually there is a quite a strong resistance against these transformations. And because of that, I would say that usually the external catalyst like uh, European, European Commission and climate kick in our case is very, very welcome actually to start the process. And when we started, uh, actually suddenly we realized that it's not so painful as it looks at the beginning and actually um, the willingness to make uh, unexpected um, coalitions and so on of, of partners, which is much higher 
then uh, it looks at the beginning of the process. Thank you. Uh, Monserrat, shall I pass back to you? I know we are nearly at time. Yes, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, my question will be uh, addressed to to the ones that they come from uh, regions and cities that they have deal with the coal transformation. Because I want to say that in this need to rewrite the rules and to transform Europe in another model, completely different, the word solidarity and the word inclusion are important. How you think that local and regional communities and workers and unions can be more engaged effectively through social contract? Because social contract, that is the contract that uh, we have with the citizens, that the administrations that Europe have with the citizens needs to be renovated, needs to be refreshed. How you have done and how do you think that we can do better to engage people, to engage workers and unions? Because Pior says that the miners, they don't want to change. But miners are not the only ones in cities and regions. We have construction workers. We have also transport workers that they play, they can play a role in this transformation. How do you think that is the key, the key element that could help to rewrite the rules in this need for to include also uh, communities, workers and citizens in this uh, research and innovation uh, that we need? I address to all, eh? in general, to Frederic and, and Enrique, but also to, to Santiago. Eh? Okay, I, I think the most important thing to engage uh, all the parts is uh, to, to, to explain very well and very clearly that the, the future must uh, come. And uh, we, we need to change. If, if we don't change altogether, the future come and we are not prepared for it. We have to prepare for it and we have to talk all the parts for, for have a common vision of the future. And uh, we have to uh, make, uh, make engagements and, and, and make a lot of, of, of talk about the things we, we have to do together. I think that it is the crucial part of all this process. We have to engage all together because the future uh, is, is now. The future is now and the future is coming. Frederick? Sorry, I had problems. I was disconnected. So I think um, the big thing is, uh, as Enrique said, so it must make sense what the transition is for. And um, it is necessary that you are able to shape the transition. That's why we think um, that the involvement of the unions and the social partners in general is uh, so important for this whole process. And um, yeah, I think this is a point uh, which needs to be needs to be implemented um, also uh, in the debate of uh, the recovery fund and and so on. And um, from the workers' point of view, from the unions' point of view, lots of innovations and also social innovations, not only technological innovations, come from um, the people. Um, who are working at their workplace. So they are uh, the founders of innovations, so it's necessary to strengthen them. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. I know that's also one of the things that I have learned consistently in the work that we are doing from working with, for example, Gipuzkoa and regions where we see exactly that happening, that the innovation, the most inspiring innovations are coming from the ground where people are testing different ways of doing things in the workplace. Okay, Montserrat, I think we, we are at the close. Yeah, um, yeah I think so that... Uh, there, is, yeah. uh, uh, there are some fantastic questions in the chat and I, I have saved the questions and we will understand how to publish them to all of the speakers so that you can follow up yourselves.
Monse, do you want to uh, there is, uh, make there, Yes, there is one uh, question addressed to the Slovenia case. How did it come about and how did you achieve the commitment across the entire government? Leadership from the top, incentives, convincing, with what? Uh, that is totally addressed to the uh, Tomas. And the other one is which potential do trade unions have to become partners in research and innovation programs? In how far will these programs have to adapt their toolbox to be appealing unions? And there is another one addressed to Giputkwa that is a very interesting approach. How do you work with cities in your province? Any interesting lessons learned for, from the local cooperation? And the last uh, is from Roman and is uh, uh, Kate Rambo is landing her done out concept at the city level. Do you think that this can have a mobilizing effect by bringing citizens and stakeholders on board on a common goal? That is so all is not addressed to to no one in concrete, but the floor is yours. I think there is one addressed to the first is addressed to the Slovenia colleague Tomas. Um, Monserrat, may, uh, is it possible for us to keep going? I think we. Uh, I'm just checking the time. Uh, whether the we are, time, if we can keep going, the time is just just the time to finish. Maybe what we can do is that to provide these questions to each one of you, and you can send to the to the the colleagues that they have uh, present the questions. And I think you and me, Kirsten, we need now to close the session because it's now five minutes past five. And uh, I want to thank you all of you for this fantastic panel. I think that all together. Uh, in solidarity, we will rewrite the rules and we will have a better Europe, more inclusive, more resilient to confront the new challenges. Thank you, Kirsten. If you want to say the last word, the floor is yours. No, I, my, it's a vote of thanks. I could not possibly say it better. Thank you so much. Very <laughs> thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.